expect anything less than a lengthy paper from me. Uh, yeah, read, read it in several settings and take your time with it, and I think it has some important uh, things in it. We're still chuckling just a bit, not that it's a laughing matter, but that the uh, message last week was entitled Lessons from Noah. And uh, in view of what happened last Saturday night in Stanton, Virginia, uh, that was not uh, known when we titled that message. But uh, this morning, I'd like to um, develop two points from that message just a little bit further. Um, and I don't know, I just, um, I just, and I think many of us feel this way, we've entered into a season where, um, you know, we don't lose our joy and we certainly don't lose our sense of peace in the Lord uh, because He is on the throne. But uh, these are, are, are very significant times and I just have a special sense um, uh, that the Lord wants to challenge us through last week's message and what I'm going to share this morning. So um, I'd like to share... Um, Mainly, uh, two concepts from Hebrews eleven seven. Noah was another who trusted God when he heard God's warning about the future. Noah believed Him, even though there was then no sign of a flood. And wasting no time, he built the ark and saved his family. Noah's belief in God was in direct contrast to the sin and disbelief of the rest of the world, which refused to obey. And because of this faith, he became one of those whom God has accepted. And I'd like to talk a little bit this morning about time and our relationship to it and the Word of God and our mindset toward His Word. Very simple concepts, but pray with me. We are increasingly understanding that it's not the, it's not the speaker or His charisma or adequacy or how articulate he is, but it is uh, the Holy Spirit and it is God's Word. And we just believe that when the Word is shared, um, hopefully in a spirit of humility and having prayed beforehand that God has something of Christ in his Word for each one of us. So let's take that attitude as we consider the Word this morning. Pray with me, please. Father, we ask simply that your Holy Spirit will quicken these words in penetrating our hearts and engendering within us the desire and motivation to order our lives consistently with your will. May your Holy Spirit do that new covenant work to remove the false way from us and enlarge our hearts that we may live and keep your word as you write it upon our hearts. Thank you for your promise to complete in us the work you've begun through the power of your Holy Spirit in Christ. Amen. So I zeroed in uh, last week on these words from Hebrews 11, 7, and wasting no time, he built the ark and saved his family. And um, Derek is going to play for us right now a video clip from one of my favorite people. And I, I just think this is very relevant to us. Time is short. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. If I told, if someone had told me when I was 20 years old, that life was very short and would pass just like that, I wouldn't have believed it. And if I tell you that, you don't believe it either. I cannot get young people to understand how brief life is, how quickly it passes. It seems like yesterday I was in school. Every one of us here has been given the same amount of time in a day. 1,440 minutes a day, 168 hours per week. 70 years God allows us. And it's interesting to me with all of our medical science, we've never passed that magic mark. The average American male today lives 70 years and four months. The average female 73 years and six months. More people live to be 70. But the average 
average age of an American is still 70 as taught in the scriptures. What a thing it is when you think that you have just one short life to spend and it'll soon be over. I'd write down my priorities in life and I'd get committed to certain priorities. Now is the accepted time. The things we ought to do, the classes we ought to take, the books we ought to read, do it now. The family that needs you, spend more time now. Write that letter home now that you've been meaning to write. Money you ought to give, give now. Time for study, do it now. People you ought to witness to, do it now. Every time the clock ticks, it seems to say now. Today, if you will hear his voice. There may not be a tomorrow for you and for me. Because there's a warning to time. Time is running out for all of us. Time is too short for indecision and vacillation. Do not halt between two opinions. Fools say that time is long. Every morning we have 86,400 seconds to spend and to invest. And each day the bank named time opens a new account for you and for me. It allows no balances and no overdrafts. If you fail to use the day's deposits, the loss is yours. The Bible says redeem the time because the days are evil and the days in which we're living are very evil. If there was ever a time for the gospel that can transform the human heart, it's now. Jesus said as long as it is day, we must do the work of him that sent us. The night is coming when no man can work. The night is going to come in your life. Yet there was a serenity about the work of the Lord Jesus. It's the quality of life, not the length. Jesus only had 33 years and it ended on the cross to the world he was a failure at that moment yet at the end of his life he said I finished the work that thou gavest me to do it doesn't matter whether you live another year or two years or five years will your work be finished is there a quality to it is there a dedication to it suppose all of our members tied their time to witness for Christ as we tithe our income for the church fill your heart with the Word of God I found that those who know the scriptures are the ones that have the power today but we need men and women who walk with God and if you do that you too can finish the work that God gave you to do and help us to realize the brevity and the urgency of time May we invest what little time we have in the kingdom of God. It's not a new word, but something I think we need to be reminded about frequently. Um, the scripture in... Um, Philippians 3 has always uh, fascinated me in, in several different respects. Paul says, I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies be ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are mature, have this attitude. Paul put his past under the cross of Jesus Christ and didn't let his past failures drag him down. Uh, he learned, I'm sure, from the past. Uh, he took a lot of lessons from the past. And if we, uh, if we learn anything from our past, as we honestly see how far short we fall in so many ways, it humbles us and it makes us realize that apart from Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. We are creatures who, apart from the appropriate relationship with our Creator, uh, we're out there on our own, independent, and we're going to fall short. And so we can learn from our past, and if it humbles us and causes us to run after Jesus Christ, 
then um, you know that's one of the functions of the past. But Paul didn't let his past drag him down. You know, Paul uh, persecuted and put to death the church. Uh, he he had to live with that, but he understood the cross of Jesus Christ, and he could put that behind him. And then Paul says, I, I look toward the goal, the prize of the upward call. He was motivated by the future. And what's interesting about his motivation about the future is he was convinced of its reality, that it was coming, that it was certain. But uh, then he didn't live or try to live in the future. He only lived in the present. And he says, in view of the future, he says, I press on toward that uh, goal of the, the high calling in Jesus Christ. The word press has always import, uh, impressed me as well in this, in this particular context. It means to pursue passionately with your whole being. And uh, when I hold myself up to the scripture, I'm constantly reminded of, oh Lord, I, I fall short so often. Help me by your Holy Spirit to have an attitude that doesn't drift into complacency and indifference or some kind of glide path, but help me to proactively press on to know you. That is the attitude that we should have as far as uh, the present is concerned. And this, this passage is not just for a few elite believers or apostles like Paul. Proverbs puts it like this for all of us. It, the writer of Proverbs says, when there is no visionary conviction about the future, people are unrestrained. That is, is the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus clear to us? Do we have a clear vision as to what's at stake and how incredibly wonderful it is and puts everything else in the present in perspective? It puts the past in perspective. Is that our motivation that leads us to press on in the present? And, and then it goes on and says, letting go the constraints toward constructive action and restraints, and restraints from wasted time, both of which are necessary to purposeful activity. I appreciate uh, these words from Rod Dreher in this context. Believers who persist in the illusion that we are in more or less normal times and react likewise are like the people who mocked Noah and his sons telling them to relax, that this rain was bound to pass. As we emphasized last week, one of the lessons from Noah is he believed what God had to say about the future. And it affected everything concerning his present and how he lived out his life, everything. So he was consumed with the vision that God gave him about the future, and it had everything to do with his priorities in the present. The second thing that I wanted to emphasize this morning um, is simply this. Um, when Noah heard God's warning, God's word about the future, Noah believed him even though there was then no sign of a flood. All he had was God's word. He didn't have any evidence in the natural that this great flood was coming. Noah's belief in God was in direct contrast to the sin and disbelief of the rest of the world, which refused to obey. And because of his faith, he became one of those whom God has accepted. I uh, want us again to listen to a, sh a very short excerpt from Billy Graham on this point. Me. But I must receive him. Secondly, the word of God does not change. The grass withered. And the flower faded, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I settled that a long time ago. There are a lot of things in this Bible I don't understand. There are questions you could ask me that I cannot answer. I don't know all the answers in this book. How can a finite mind like mine comprehend the infinite? I cannot. 
So one day I opened the Bible and I said, Oh Lord, I accept this as your word by faith. And that settled it from that moment on. When I quote the scriptures, I know that I'm quoting the word of God. It's a living word. And lastly, the way of salvation has not changed. All these centuries, the way to the kingdom of God is exactly the same. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He will never change. But you must change. Very, very simple words, very, very simple truth, and yet that sometimes which is most simple is the most profound. He will never change, but we must change. Uh, he is the Lord, we are not. Uh, he's there uh, for us to serve Him. He's not there for uh, to serve us uh, based on our being self-centered individuals who want to do it our way. Um, a very sobering passage um, is in 2 Thessalonians 2 and talks about the spirit of lawlessness that I think is so characteristic in our culture today, unlike anything we've ever seen. And he talks about the spirit of Antichrist that's at work. And then at the, um, pretty much toward the end of that passage, uh, he writes, Paul writes, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This was back in his day, first century. And he describes it as being with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Now listen to why they perished. Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. The crucial issue, I believe, in our day, and I think we can reduce it down to this, is whether we are lovers of truth, the truth that is proclaimed to us by God through Jesus Christ and through His teaching, through His Word. And our love for His truth cannot be merely in the form of mental assent. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will, love, we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. God's word is not only true, and therefore uh, it is authoritative. It's true, and because it's true, it's authoritative. Because it's authoritative, and it comes from God, it's true. And so the issue of the day is whether we will bow the knee of our own personal preferences to the authoritative word of his truth, as did Noah. This is something that I've had to deal with on an ongoing basis. It's, it's a part of the ongoing process of working out our relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit. It never really becomes any more complicated than this. And so I discover in my own life oftentimes the way I'm living, the way I'm using my time, as an evidence that I've kind of slipped, maybe, in terms of being focused on the Lordship, the authoritative truth of Jesus Christ and His Word. And this is something that in 2 Thessalonians 2 we see makes all the difference. Um, because what we're seeing today in this culture is people who are professing believers being sucked up into the Spirit of lawlessness. And, and, and what is the primary dynamic here? Um, it's putting our own personal preferences above the Word of God. It's not loving God's truth as our highest priority. It's interesting, in Second Thessalonians, the passage we were just in, uh, we usually stop where I stopped but it goes on and it says this. Paul says, We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation 
through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was this, for this he called you through the gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions, the truth which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. As we uh, have considered in a number of recent messages, Paul tells us in Romans 8 and other scriptures that salvation is directly linked to sanctification. Our ongoing process of being transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ, Romans 8. And so in this passage here, in, this, in the same breath, he links sanctification with our having faith in the truth. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Being made free is being sanctified in the truth. Being sanctified in the truth is being made more and more like Jesus, because being made more and more like Jesus is consistent with God's creation reality and design for us. It's our, it's our greatest fulfillment is to be made like Jesus Christ, because that's the way God originally created us to be. And one of the primary elements of that process is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives using the truth to deliver us, as the psalmist says, from false thinking about truth and reality, bringing us into conformity with the truth of his reality. We're in a culture where lawlessness is less and less restrained, and professing religious people are getting sucked up into that because they're not grounded, simply grounded, in the truth of God's Word. And I think the Spirit would say to us that uh, this is not a time to be complacent or indifferent or casual about any of this. It's, it's not a finger-shaking word from the Holy Spirit. It is just simple and an encouragement that while it's still today, let's make sure that we're asking God to help us with our priorities. In closing, let me share this uh, simple insight from Augustine that I've shared before that I think uh, it's, it's quite profound. If you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, it's not the gospel you believe, but yourself. This is what we're seeing all around us, religious people, professing Christians, um, who want it this way, or want it that way, or want it whatever way, uh, want it my way, moralistic therapeutic deism. God is there, yes, I need to serve him and I need to live a good moral life, but he's mainly there to make me happy uh, and do it my way. No, he's not. He's the Lord. And uh, we either fall on our knees before him and bow the knee before him at the cross or the rock of stumbling falls on us and crushes us. We can't have it our way. It has to be his way. And his way is the way of life. And I just think um, the Holy Spirit is encouraging us. It's not just a single message on a Sunday, but he's encouraging us like... Uh, you know, let's, let's make sure we understand our times. That's largely what the paper is about. Let's understand our times and realize that we cannot procrastinate. Cannot procrastinate. But we need to repent as an ongoing way of life uh, and bow the knee to Jesus Christ who is himself the truth. And we need to love the truth passionately and we need to ask the Lord to, to work in our hearts by the Holy Spirit wherever there's a holdout area of our heart uh, to say, Lord, melt that resistance and let me submit myself fully to your Lordship, to your authoritative truth. 
That's what Noah did. And may we walk in Noah's footsteps. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, this is uh, not uh, an ear-tickling message, but it is also the truth. And you desire that we passionately love the truth. Thank you that the truth is Jesus Christ. It's not some philosophic system, but it is the living Lord Jesus Christ and that all truth then flows through and from his being as God, the Son, the Word of God to man. Lord, fill us, fill me with a conviction, a, a renewed conviction of our need to love the truth. And by your Holy Spirit, infuse within us strength and courage to walk in that truth as did Noah and others like him. Lord, we are no match for the power of the devil. We are no match for his deceiving power in and of ourselves. But we need to be filled with your Holy Spirit and with your truth. So we pray that you would lead us not into temptation, but that you would deliver us from evil. And help us, Lord, to be your authentic disciples as we purpose to abide in your word. Lord, your word is truth. Sanctify us in your truth. And we ask this in Christ. Amen.